I'm Ryan Balmer and this is Berlin Reguided. In a series of videos, I'll be examining the history of the German capital, from the repressive to the revolutionary, the vibrant and the volatile. We'll be using some of Berlin's best known sites to tell that story, but you can expect us to veer dramatically off the beaten track in later episodes. In today's first episode, we'll be focusing on the Reichstag building behind me and specifically on its role in the formation of the Nazi dictatorship in 1933. It's a violent event which takes place within that building, which allows the Nazis to make that first step towards turning a government into a dictatorship. We're also going to be using one of Berlin's uh, many monuments to uh, go deeper into the story of the aftermath of that fire in 1933 to show how the Nazis began to systematically shut down and effectively neutralise political opposition. You join me on an uncharacteristically sunny February afternoon in Berlin. I'm standing in the former West Berlin district of Tiergarten, the former hunting reserve of the Prussian aristocracy, but also home to much of the Regierungsviertel or German government quarter constructed in the 1990s in preparation for the return of the German parliament to Berlin. You can see elements of that behind me in the form of the Paul Löber House, but also behind me a much more instantly recognisable symbol of Berlin and of Germany itself. It's the Reichstag building, first opened in 1894. But what does the Reichstag mean for the German people? Well, it very much depends, of course, on the German you ask. Some will talk about how the building symbolises the birth of Germany itself, the birth of the empire at least, or the Reich, back in 1871. The building is very characteristic of the time. It's very imperial, it's very grand, it really makes a statement. It screams that a new empire has arrived. Now, of course, that empire will not last very long. It will come crashing down at the end of the Great War, when the last German emperor, or Kaiser, Wilhelm II, runs away to the Netherlands, never to return. The Germany that emerges from that chaos will become known as the Weimar Republic. This very optimistic experiment in democracy and liberal ideas. Here's Philip Scheidemann addressing the crowd gathered outside the Reichstag on the 9th of November 1918. The Social Democrat somewhat excitably proclaimed to the clamouring masses, the old and rotten, the monarchy has collapsed. The new may live, long live the German Republic. The after effects of the war, plus the humiliating Treaty of Versailles, however, would mean that the new Republic would be beset by colossal difficulties throughout its brief existence. I would say it's a reasonably commonly held belief that once the Wall Street crash takes place in 1929, that the rise of National Socialism in Germany is somewhat inevitable and unstoppable. But it's not quite as simple as that. We should look at the elections of 1932 as an example. Germany has two federal elections that year, in July and November. Between the first and the second election, however, the Nazis' popularity actually drops considerably when their percentage of the vote falls by around 4%. There are, of course, a number of reasons why this might have been the case. Many German voters had began to lose patience with the National Socialists, who seemed absolutely unwilling to cooperate with other German parties in coalition governments. Much more damaging for the Nazis, perhaps, was the after effects of a strike that took place at the very beginning of November 1932. It was a strike 
of the Berlin Transportation Services. And it was partly organised by elements loyal to both the Nazi Party and the Communist Party. It certainly seems that those centre-right voters who had voted for the National Socialists, perhaps even as recently as July 1932, began to abandon them in droves. One party, however, who had made substantial gains in the November 1932 elections was the KPD, or the Communist Party of Germany. It says quite a lot about the chaotic, seesaw nature of the German political system in the Weimar period. That, that increased support for the Communists is perhaps one of the main reasons why the Nazis were able to take power. Prominent German industrialists, perhaps terrified by the increased support that the Communists had received, began to look to the Nazi party and to Adolf Hitler as potential saviours. In the aftermath of that election, discussions will start to take place about the formation of what's to be known as the Hitler cabinet. That cabinet will be sold to the German people as a broad representation of conservative Germany, along with, of course, the Nazi party members themselves in prominent roles. There will be a number of key roles occupied by members of the German National People's Party. There are also a number of roles given to prominent independent reactionaries. Although the Nazis will try to maintain this uh, somewhat ludicrous facade of legality and legitimacy right through the 30s and 40s, there are hints of what's to come, I think, even during the discussions surrounding the formation of that cabinet in 1933. Adolf Hitler makes it quite clear that he has great optimism when it comes to the Nazis' chances of gaining a majority in the upcoming March elections. I have to say that's remarkably optimistic, given that the party had just lost considerable amounts of support in the previous election in November 1932. It should be pointed out, of course, that for quite some time before the formation of that cabinet, the Nazis had been making some of their intentions known. As early as 1932, the Nazis had openly been talking about the incarceration in camps of left-wing opponents. Adolf Hitler demands Nazi roles in the ministries of the interior of both the German state and Prussia itself. By the 22nd of February 1933, Hermann Göring has drafted in around 50,000 so-called auxiliaries who are supposedly there to assist the Prussian police. These men, of course, overwhelmingly are drafted from Nazi paramilitary units such as the SA or the Brown Shirts. It becomes abundantly clear that the impartiality of the German police was being rapidly eroded. In any case, before these elections can take place, and only five days after Goering's beefing up of the Prussian police with these so-called auxiliaries, someone sets this building on fire. One thing that we will not be examining today is the uh, fire itself. Uh, so I won't be talking about how the fire may have been set. I uh, will almost completely avoid any discussion of who might have set the fire, uh, apart from in the next couple of minutes. And that's not because I see that as unimportant. In fact, I think the circumstances surrounding the fire deserve an episode all of their own. And something else that requires much more detailed examination further down the line is how the opinion changes when it comes to great historical periods, events and figures. The Reichstag fire of 1933 is a case in point. Only a couple of decades ago, history teachers would unequivocally tell their students that it was the Nazis who set fire to the building because 
Who else could it have been? Look at the series of coincidences surrounding the fire itself. The laws that were being passed even before the fire was set. The statements that high-ranking Nazis had made. Look at the aftermath, in fact. Look at how the Nazis used that fire to begin to shut down the political left. And that's all well and good, but these days, any historian worth their salt will tell you that something drastically different happened back in February 1933. They will tell you, in fact, that it was Marinus van der Lubbe, a young Dutch leftist who was put on trial by the Nazi state in the summer of 1933. They will also tell you that it's highly likely that Marinus van der Lubbe was in fact acting alone. Van der Lubbe was ultimately the only one of the defendants on trial that year to be found guilty of setting the fire and he was executed in January 1934. One of van der Lubbe's co-accused was a fairly remarkable Bulgarian named Georgi Dimitrov. Dimitrov would be the future leader of communist Bulgaria after the war. This is a poster I picked up of him from the Sofia Museum of Communism a couple of years ago. It's stuck on the outskirts of the city if you're interested in a fairly unremarkable spot squeezed between a second-hand car dealership and a somewhat soul-destroying shopping centre. There was an incredible scene where he faced Hermann Göring himself. After a fairly combative exchange, Göring exclaimed that Dimitrov was a crook and a scoundrel who belongs on the gallows. Nevertheless, Dimitrov and his two Bulgarian co-accused were found innocent of all charges, unlike the unfortunate van der Lubbe. Once again, we will be delving much more deeply into this in a future episode, focusing on the Reichstag fire itself. Naturally, the arrest of mostly foreign communists in connection with the Reichstag fire is immediately leapt upon by the Nazi propaganda machine. This is exactly what they've been warning people about for years, they say. As Chancellor, however, there is only so much that Adolf Hitler can do. He has to rely on the support and the cooperation of the German head of state. Just behind me, you can see the offices of the German Chancellor. Now, the German political system has changed in many ways dramatically since 1933, but there are a number of things that have remained the same. For example, the Chancellor is not the actual head of state. It is, of course, the German president who occupies that role. And back in 1933, it was only the president, Paul von Hindenburg, who could use special emergency powers in the time of a state of emergency or national crisis. So Adolf Hitler has to get Hindenburg on board with what comes next. The Berlin of the 21st century is a city which is full of monuments and memorials to victims of the Nazi period. Right outside the Reichstag building today is a monument for 96 victims of the Nazis, former Reichstag deputies, many of whom were arrested in the immediate aftermath of that fire in 1933. Each one of these plates contains a victim's name, their year of birth, the year of death, the place of death, invariably a concentration camp or prison, and of course the political party which they belong to. The first one is Charlotte or Lotte Tinker, born 1898, murdered in 1944. She was a member of the Communist Party, the KPD. She had actually went into hiding after the Reichstag fire to avoid the fate of many of her fellow Communist Party members and representatives. She had actually fled Germany there afterwards into exile in the Netherlands, only to return in 1934. She was expelled from the Communist Party that same year 
because she had refused to continue active participation because of fears of much worse to come. Despite her almost complete political inactivity for more than a decade, she is arrested in the summer of 1944. She's taken to a concentration camp which lies around 90 kilometres north of Berlin called Ravensbrück. It was a camp opened up in 1939, supposedly exclusively for female inmates. She is murdered there in November of that year. Also remembered here is the former Communist Party leader, Ernst Tellmann. Tellmann was rounded up as early as March 1933. These special emergency powers that had been granted by Hindenburg are used to shut down freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, the printing of certain political party newspapers. They also authorise wiretaps, indefinite incarceration without the necessary warrants. Germany was very much on its way to becoming a police state. As a prominent communist, Tellman was pretty high up on the list. He spends much of the next 11 years in solitary confinement. On the 18th of August 1944, Tellman will finally be murdered by the SS in the concentration camp Buchenwald. The official report though will stipulate that Tellman was actually killed as a result of an Allied bombing raid upon that camp, which claimed the life, they say, of a number of other prominent opponents of the Nazi dictatorship. I find it astonishing that even this late in the day, in the summer of 1944, that the National Socialist Dictatorship is still desperately clinging to this facade of legitimacy and legality, trying to in some way absolve themselves of responsibility for deaths occurring in the concentration camp system. Among the 96 names, however, are a number of non-leftists, people who were not members of the Social Democrats or the Communists. They include a handful of members of the Catholic Centre Party. One of the more significant members of the Centre Party at the time was Eugen Boltz. Boltz in March 1933 voted along with the rest of all the Centre Party representatives in attendance to pass the Enabling Act that had been demanded by the Nazis. So why are members of the Catholic Centre Party voting alongside the National Socialists? Well, I guess there are three potential reasons that are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Some say that the Centre Party were duped by the Nazis into believing that these extraordinary powers granted by the Enabling Act would be used primarily for much needed economic reforms. The second reason is because of the religious affiliation of that party itself. The Catholic Centre Party had been assured by the Nazis, of course, that the rights of the Catholic Church in Germany would continue to be protected and respected. I think if we just step back from Germany for a second, however, you could see perhaps there is something bigger going on. The Vatican had, of course, reached a very favourable agreement with the fascist Italian dictatorship back in 29, and they appear to have been holding out for a similar agreement with any upcoming dictatorship in Germany. And the third reason, much more immediate, I think, is the fact that there are hundreds of brown shirts swarming around the voting chamber, inside and outside, literally looking over the shoulders of the Reichstag deputies as they are about to pass their votes. It must have been enormously intimidating for these members of the Centre Party. But it's also worth pointing out that none of the 94 members of the Social Democrats who were in attendance voted for that act. In any case, Eugen Boltz's vote for the Enabling Act wouldn't do him much good. Within a matter of weeks, in June 1933, he too is arrested on trumped-up charges. He is then forced to keep a reasonably low profile for the next few years. In the 1940s, however, he's approached 
by those intending to assassinate Adolf Hitler and to replace the Nazi dictatorship with a broad and legitimate coalition of German politicians. One which would be acceptable not only to the German people, but ideally to the Western Allies. Boltz is offered the job of the Minister of Culture, which he accepts, in theory at least. In the aftermath of that failed assassination attempt in July 1944, Boltz will become one of thousands who are arrested all across the country. Unlike Boltz, the vast majority of them had absolutely no connection to the assassination whatsoever. But this had been a plan that had been formulated perhaps as early as 1942. Adolf Hitler had stipulated that in the event of any coup or any assassination attempt that prominent politicians from the Weimar period, from the centre and the left, be rounded up and perhaps neutralised. Boltz falls foul to this. He is taken to Plötzensee prison to the north of Berlin and he is guillotined there at the start of 1945. And that's where I'd like to leave it today. We'll be making a much deeper dive into some of the topics discussed in this first episode. You can expect a much closer look at the Weimar Republic or resistance to the Nazi dictatorship in later episodes. But we'll also be coming back to the Reichstag again and again over the coming months because it's a building which plays a major role in many different periods in this city, in this country's history. If you recall in my introduction, I talked about how a violent event within this building was one of the first steps towards establishing a dictatorship in 1933, regardless of who set that fire in the first place. But of course, it would not be the last violent event to take place in the Reichstag building. Much further down the line, I'll be talking about what happened in this building in 1945 during the battle for Berlin. That second violent event when this building is taken by the Soviet Union will effectively become the beginning of the end of the Nazi dictatorship.